Well, thanks for being with, with us tonight. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here. Tonight, I want to teach on the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, it, Christ's first major sermon to the crowds, takes three chapters. <laughs> so obviously, I can't teach the whole thing. But one of the things we can do is we can look and see what Christ has done, what he's focused on. And really, there's two I would say there's there's three major pieces of focus, but mainly two. There's a focus on the hope, and that is a that's a foundation, and he spoke it right at the beginning, and it sets the foundation. And then throughout the rest of the three chapters, what he focuses on are things that that uh, contribute to good interpersonal relationships. That's one thing. And the other thing is steps and things that we need to do to be godly. So I call this godliness and relationship, and you'll see this go back and forth. So I want to start uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we're just going to start at the very beginning. Uh, let's see here. Get there myself. Um, because the when we look at all of the things that Christ could have said, to these crowds, the fact that he begins with the hope is quite a model for us. Because honestly, you know, if we're talking to people about getting saved, if we're talking to people who are saved about upping their game and being more godly and this and that and the other thing, what is the point if there's no hope? If it's not going to matter? And the, the devil has really stolen this from the average Christian because I have actually talked to ministers and asked them, what is the difference between a, a really good committed Christian who reads their Bible, goes to church, shares their faith, gives to the poor, and just a Christian that we call, you know, a, what do you call them, Christmas and Easter Christian, they, they believe in Jesus Christ and they show up at church on Christmas and Easter and don't know. And, and, People are confused. They're like, well, I, I don't really know. You know what? I, I guess maybe the committed Christians get to be closer to Christ, you know, and, and so there's a bunch of guesswork. And this is all because people don't understand the hope. You know, Christ said that if we are overcomers, then we will reign with him. And verse chapters like Jeremiah 23 talk about the fact that there will be leaders in the kingdom on earth. When Christ brings his kingdom to earth, some people will be leaders. Some people, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, won't have anything. So they'll, they'll just be servants. When Galatians 5 says that if you're, you know, if you live according to the works of the flesh, if that's the lifestyle that you practice, the Bible says you will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Well, some people misunderstand that and take, take it to mean that you're not going to be saved. But these are Christian people. They're just Christian people who let their flesh uh, rule them, if you will. And if you go back and you study Abraham, Abraham lived in the promised land. But the Bible is very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter, I mean, in Acts chapter 7, that he had no inheritance there. He owned a burial cave for his wife, Sarah. He had no inheritance in the land of Canaan, the promised land, but he lived there. And so when we talk about the, the future hope, it's this huge spectrum that goes all the way from being very faithful, walking in your ministry, doing what the, the Sermon on the Mount says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and therefore reigning with Christ, or defying Christ, ignoring Christ, and you get to live in the kingdom, but, but you, you, you haven't got any possessions there. You have no inheritance there, like Abraham had no inheritance in the promised land, in his first life, then, then God promised him, you know, I will give this land to you. See, that's how one of the ways we know there has to be a resurrection. <laughs> God said, I will give this land to you and to your seed. And then Acts tells us, and of course, we know this from history, Abraham no inheritance there. So his inheritance is the hope. So Christ did us a favor in setting forth a fabulous model that the first thing he talked about is the hope to give people a reason for changing, a reason for living and being godly. 
So verse one says, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. If you remember when Christ was in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4, it says he stood up to read. And that was a custom at the time. Generally, people, the, the, when they, you were going to read the words of God, you stood up. And when you were going to teach, you sat back down. So here he sits down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, which is an idiom for those who are humble. Uh, poor is, is also used of being humble. Blessed are those who are humble in their spirit or in their pride, if you will, because the word spirit can be used of your thoughts, your emotions, and that's the way it is here. You're humble in your thoughts uh, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Uh, in Matthew, we'll see, you will see a preponderance of the phrase kingdom of heaven. The good Jews felt a little squeamish about using the name of God. So in most cases, they used a circumlocution. Uh, the same thing that the modern Jews today, they speak of Hashem, the name. And, and uh, I once I took a little bit of Hebrew under a, a lady one time. And I asked her if, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm her student, and I asked her, will it bother you if I use the name Yahweh? And she said, yes, it will. Please don't use it. So uh, out of respect, I didn't. But you, when you read the Gospel of Luke, <laughs> the good old Greek physician, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, God this, God that, <laughs> you read Matthew, and you don't see that. He uses circumlocutions. Uh, and here's a good example of it. Blessed are the humble and, and, and pride uh, because the, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Um, if you're humble, you get you obey God, you get born again, or in this case, you get saved, and then you're in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When? In the future kingdom. Does the Bible prophet promise that? Yes, it's, it's all over Isaiah. They'll be comforted in the future. Verse 5, blessed are the humble, they will inherit the earth. If you're reading the REB, you notice that that's in black type because it's a quotation directly out of Psalm 37. And they'll inherit the earth when in the resurrection, when they're raised to it. Uh, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness here is used more in the sense of justice. That if you're upset with the injustice in the courts, the injustice in the governmental system, the injustice in the world around you, um, and you're hungering and thirsting for a time when there's going to be justice, then there are verses like in Isaiah where it says righteousness, or you and I might know it as justice, will be the belt around his waist. So the next the future kingdom will be, the, the, it'll just be a, a righteous, just kingdom. Uh, but it's in the future. It's not now. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy when at the judgment and in the future. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God when after they're resurrected. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the children of God when in the resurrection. Um, and I think it even used Christ even used the phrase they will be sons of the of the resurrection. Verse uh, ten. Blessed are those who have been persecuted because of their righteousness, our stand on what is right and what is godly, and that's happening more and more uh, in loads of different fields, um, in the way people dress, in the language people speak, in the sexual behavior. Uh, lots of, there's lots of persecution for people who will take a stand. It says, blessed are those who've been persecuted because of their righteousness. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then you're blessed when people insult you and persecute you and do all kinds of nasty things uh, for the name of Christ uh, because of me, says Christ. And there's great reward for that. So the first thing Christ starts out with in this three-chapter Sermon on the Mount is the hope. And again, that sets a model for us that when we're talking to people, approaching to pe approaching people, and we want them to shift that having a good way of presenting the hope is very important. Then he talks about people, and it's again, like I'm saying, it shifts back and forth. So now here's a emphasis on personal godliness, 13 to 16. And so it talks about you being the salt of the earth 
and being the light of the of the world. And so verse 16, let your light shine. So this is a shift. This is an emphasis on personal godliness. The hope came first. Now, okay, you want to walk in a way you can appropriate the blessings of that hope to you. Then he goes into a section from 17 to 20, uh, four verses, where he talks about, again, personal righteousness, righteous behavior. And again, he talks about the kingdom of heaven, um, verse 20, or 19, rather. Uh, if you break one of the commandments and teach others to do the same, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I like that in verse 19 because it doesn't say you'll be unsaved. You know, there are people that just get misled. They, you know, particularly in this culture, people that are stepping out to teach, what are they going to teach? They're going to teach what their teachers say is true, just like happens in the church today. So if you're misled by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those kind of people, and in the honesty of your heart, you're teaching, but what you're teaching is wrong. Okay, well, you're going to get corrected for it, but you're still going to be in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches, uh, t does the commandments and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There's a an implied application here to you and I that it's it's important for us. We hear our teachers, but we check out what they say. If anybody calls me and say, well, I listened to your teaching and then I went to the word and checked out what you say, great. I am happy as a clam. You could not make me happier because you've got to speak and teach and live out of your own conviction. And there's so many people that are misled by false teachers. And we, we want to see if we can step in and correct that. So... Uh, and then I want to point out verse 20, because it's one of those verses that it's important to see. There are times when it will come up in your own life and times when you think it, feel it, and you need to bite your tongue because it's not the appropriate time to say it. The, the teachers of the law, the experts in the law, and um, where to get off to? Uh, yeah, verse 20. The experts in the law and the Pharisees were the teachers. They were the leaders. Normally, you wouldn't speak against them. But in this particular case, where Christ is teaching to the multitudes in his first major sermon, and he's trying to make an impact, and he's trying to change people's lives, he has he, he is led by God, in this case, to speak out against those people. And so he says in verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the experts in the law and the Pharisees, you will absolutely not, and the Greek uses a very strong, you will not not. Uh, in English, a double not is, is, if you will not not, you will. A double not in English is a yes, but a double not in Greek is like a really, did you hear me say not? Not. <laughs> that, that, that's how it works. If your righteousness doesn't exceed the, the experts of the law and the Pharisees, you will absolutely not enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and I'm sure there were Pharisees in his audience that were offended at that. And there are times, like I say, there are times when you are led and you should absolutely say this kind of thing. For example, I feel about our government that we are making some grave, grave mistakes that are, are going to put our children in, in a world of hurt. Um, you know, the, and sometimes you just need to say it, and sometimes you just need to bite your tongue. It's important for us to see that Christ said it. You can't go to the ministry of Christ and say, wow, he never openly offended the scribes and Pharisees, because he did. It was rare, but he did, and that's, that's a model for us. And so then we, we move on, and he talks in the next section, murder, anger, reconciliation. And I like this because he talks about the importance of reconciliation, the importance of personal relationships, and how personal relationships can be more important than religiosity. So he says in verse 23, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and if we stop there and said, okay, 
in the mind of the average first century Jew, how important was it to offer a gift at the altar? In other words, what, what Christ is going to do here is he's coming up with a startling statement. Because in the mind of a first century Jew, offering a gift at the altar was like unbelievably important. You know, it's commanded in the law of Moses. It's, it's just this super important thing. And so Christ is going to use that as a startling statement to grab people's attention. And he says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go your way. Be reconciled to your brother first and then come and offer your gift. And so Christ here sets relationship above religiosity. And, you know, this, um, I think about sometimes how strongly we can feel about fellowships. And, you know, I, for years and years and years, I ran a fellowship in my home. I felt very strongly about it. And, you know, I know there were times where I could have called my assistant leader or somebody and asked them to run the fellowship because what I was doing with people was more important. But in my brain at the time, oh, running a fellowship is so, and I, and I elevated it above what I should have. What's really important is those heart relationships. Sure, if you can put off conversations or something, that's fine. But we should, there's, we've just got to have a heart and an understanding of how important relationships are and be willing to set some things aside to build those relationships. And I love the fact that Christ used this particular illustration, bringing a gift to the altar, because that was so embedded in the minds of the Jews at the time that when he said this, it must have just absolutely jarred them. But that's the whole point, isn't it? To get people to change, to shake people up, to get them out of their patterns of religiosity. And Christ definitely did that. And then he talked about in verse 25, agreeing with your opponent. Then the next section on adultery and divorce, uh, verses 27 to 32, uh, I'm not going to cover those. They're pretty clear. But again, they're about relationship. So what we've got is Matthew 5, 21, 26 is about relationship. Uh, Matthew 5, 17 to 20 was about relationship. This, this section here, 17 to 32, is about relationship. Now we go to verse 33, and we're in a section on oaths from 33 to 37. And again, what is oaths about? Well, that's kind of a blend of your personal godliness and what you're willing to swear to God and, and your relationships. Because... Um, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, down here in, in Florida, 37, verse 37, let your speech be yes, yes, or no, no. And whatever is more than this is of the wicked one. And I'm, I'm one of the things that I constantly hear down here in Southwest Florida is the number of people that you talk to who say, particularly, you know, like repairmen, carpenters, plumbers, you know, all those guys, you need help, you call up, I will, I will, I will come tomorrow, or I will call you back tomorrow. And they absolutely don't. They just it, it, people down here just honestly, with very rare exception, just don't seem to care if what they say doesn't line up with what they do. Let's take a quick look at Psalm uh, Psalm 15. Psalm 15. I love Psalm 15 for one reason. I love it is it's so blasted short. <laughs> you know, you can just read it and, and get a grip on it, um, you know, which is really nice. I mean, Psalm 119, you know, <laughs> you just, I, I grow a beard by the time I've read Psalm 119. It's just so long, <laughs> you know, and trying to keep everything in it in mind. But Psalm 15 is so powerful. And I love the uh, verse four, you know, it, this is uh, Verse one, O Yahweh, who can sojourn in your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? In other words, who, who can be close to you and stay close to you? And then as you read through this, you know, verse two, he who walks blamelessly. Verse four, who looks upon a vile person with contempt, but honors those who fear Yahweh. And then 
who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change his mind. And that is such a powerful truth, such an easy thing to do to make promises. It can be such a difficult thing to keep promises. You know, and Christ here is talking about, again, we're in the Sermon on the Mount about relationships, godliness, you keep your oaths, and in your relationship, you do what you say you're going to do. And all I can think of is, how did this make it into the Sermon on the Mount 2,000 years ago? Why is this part of the Sermon on the Mount 2,000 years ago? Because they had the same problem 2,000 years ago we have today. People saying they do things and wouldn't do them. <laughs> so that's that's a perennial problem. It's been around since Adam and Eve, I'm assuming. It certainly was around at the time of Christ. And then, you know, we have to be the fish that swim the other way. We We have to be the ones that if we make a statement, we keep what we say, even if it hurts. And if for something comes up and we can't keep our word, then we're humble. We're not arrogant. Well, you know what happened in my life. I mean, how could I possibly get my way? You know, we're not arrogant. We're, we're just humble and we understand things come up in life and we humbly apologize and ask people to forgive us. And then Christ talks about um, uh, turning the other cheek. And I think, you know, we, we know that. Um, and again, this would be relationship stuff and how we enter into relationship with other people. And then the last section in chapter five, love your enemies. Um, and I wanna talk about that just a second. So let's go to uh, verse 43. And again, obviously then you know if it's about love your enemies, then it's gonna be about relationships. So verse 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that one, I really understand. I mean, it. you know, I, there are things that I blame the scribes and Pharisees for, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> because if you read the Old Testament, God makes it very clear that he hates the wicked. You guys would might remember um, Psalm, well, Psalm 1115. Let's just take 11.5 rather. Let's just take a look at Psalm 11, verse 5. And this is just, we could we could do probably a couple dozen things here. Um, but verse five of Psalm Psalm, did I say verse? Did I say Psalm five five? If I did, good. <laughs> anyway, Psalm five, verse five. The ones who boast cannot stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of wickedness. And then, you know, if you go back to uh, to Matthew and he says, hate your enemy. If you remember in Proverbs, you know, there are six things the Lord hates. Se yes, seven, you know, that he hates. He hates prideful people, liars, murderers, wicked people. He hates people that do evil. He hates false witnesses. He hates divisive people. So there's these lists of people the Lord hates. And if we're supposed to, you put yourself in the in the position of the teaching Pharisees. If we're supposed to behave like God, then, then we're going to hate our, our enemies too. So I don't blame the Pharisees for teaching this. All they're doing is teaching the Old Testament. So, you know, remember when Christ said at the Last Supper, I bring you a new commandment. Well, that really started here with the Sermon on the Mount. There were a lot of new commandments, and this was really one of them. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But then what does he say? Um, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that really was a, a new revelation brought from Christ. And so when we talk about did Christ change the law? Did Christ change the cultural norms of his time among the believing community? And the answer is absolutely yes. And then when it says, uh, you know, love your enemy, I think what we need to understand here is that there's not an equivocation between love and like. It doesn't say you have to like your enemy. When we love our enemies, it means we behave like God. God sends the rain on the just and unjust alike. 
if uh, the illustration in the Old Testament is if you see your your enemy's donkey fallen down under its load, help him out with it. So we we don't have to like our enemies, but we have to act like God toward them. We have to be able to bless them out of a pure heart, help them when they need help. Um, and that's the way we love our enemy. And so Christ said, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. You know, if we curse people who persecute us, it only makes them worse. We don't want them to be worse. <laughs> we want them to be better. <laughs> so, you know, we'd, we'd like their, their hearts to break and for them to change. And periodically that actually does. So we pray for people who persecute us. And then if we do that, we can be the sons of our father who's in heaven. And then he's, you know, talked about the sun coming up and the rain and that kind of thing. And then verse 48, I like. Therefore, you are to be mature as your heavenly father is mature. The mature way of looking at life is to realize that we need to be loving to everybody. We're not God. We're not the judges. The only way we're ever going to change anybody is by loving them and showing them an example of what true godliness looks like. That's exactly what Christ did. And he changed people. And so here he changes the law. So this is the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to chapter six. In chapter six, we have the, the same kind of uh, pattern where there's a lot on relationships and godliness and relationships. And we start in verse one with giving to the needy. And he says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness, basically, in other words, helping others in front of people in order to be seen by them. If we're doing good deeds so that other people notice the good deeds we're doing, our heart's not in the right place. And, and Christ says, for then you have no reward laid up with your father who is in heaven. See, when we, when we give to the needy, we lend to God. There's a great, um, great proverb about that. Um, let's see. But where, where is that? It's Proverbs 19. I think it's Proverbs 19. Uh, I can't remember. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, Proverbs 19.17. So let's go to Proverbs 19.17. This is a, a really cool, nifty proverb. So Proverbs 19.17 says, The one who shows favor to the poor person lends to Yahweh and he will repay him according to his good work. So when we help out a poor person, what we're doing is basically we're, we're by lending that money, material goods, our time, whatever it is, to that needy person, we're actually lending it to Yahweh, and he will repay us uh, at the day of judgment. And that's just a really neat proverb and a, a great um, kind of a motivational reminder. So. Christ says, you know, how to do that. Don't, uh, when you give to the, the poor, then don't just do it to be seen by others, but do it with a, a pure heart. It's a true uh, heart of blessing. And then uh, Matthew 6, 5 to 15, he's going to talk about prayer. And you and I know a lot about prayer. We know the importance of prayer. Um, You know, there's so much in the New Testament than about prayer. In the Old Testament, there, there's not as many commands about prayer. Um, we see people doing it, like you see Solomon praying, you see Daniel praying faithfully, that kind of thing. But there aren't a number of commands. And I think one of the things that we can really help our fellow Christians with is if we lead them in prayer. I recently met a person that I would have normally expected to um, just be kind of a prayer warrior just because of his position and stuff. And so I, I ended up in a meeting with him and, and he was asked to pray. And, and he said, you know, I've, I've never really prayed in public. And I was completely floored. You know, prayer is is warfare prayer gets things done christians need to pray and i'm I, I 
I mean, a quandary about what to do with the Christian church, because you can go to almost any church you want, drive up and down the street, find a church, point it out, go there on Sunday morning, and they don't have congregational prayer. The minister pray, prays, sometimes somebody in the choir prays, something like that. But the average Christian in the average congregation does not pray. And yet there's so many commands about being faithful in prayer. And uh, you're not going to get good in prayer unless you pray a lot, you know, because uh, sometimes you fumble bumble over your words. Sometimes you pray for stuff that you think sounds stupid, all that, all that stuff that you go through. We have got to engage the Christian church in more prayer. And when we get Christians together, just kind of stop as a group and say, hey, you know, can we have a little bit of prayer? Just there's there's some things that need to be lifted. I mean, I, I think this is really super important. Then starting in Matthew uh, verse 16, um, Matthew 6, 16, we go into fasting. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on fasting. I think a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that for the Jews, fasting was commanded. The Day of Atonement was a day that the, there is at least two different commands that specifically say the Day of Atonement is a day to afflict your soul. And the rabbis understood, and I think rightly so, that that meant not to eat. It was to be a Sabbath, so you couldn't, uh, you couldn't prepare food anyway. So if you can't prepare food and then you afflict your soul. Of course, there were obviously exceptions for the very weak and the very young and that kind of thing. But if you were a particularly a mature male on the Day of Atonement, the law of Moses said basically don't eat. And so it was very important here in the Sermon on the Mount for Christ to cover fasting because it was part of what they were commanded to do and part of their customs. It doesn't because it become as important to us because we don't have that in the New Testament. But there are still people who, and properly so, you know, let a man be convinced in his own mind. There are people who fast for various things to uh, increase their prayer power, sharpen their spirituality, feel lighter and less sluggish. There's a lot of good medical health reasons for fasting. And so there are people that do. And so I think the way Christ opened it up, when you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. <laughs> you know, if you're going to fast, then, then you're doing it. So put it, wash your face, put a smile on your face, and people don't need to know about it. It's, it's, you're being, you're doing it between you and God. Then he talks about wealth and worry. And so I want to, I want to cover this in uh, verse, starting in verse 19, because I think wealth and worry are problems in our culture. And so uh, we need to deal with that. So in verse 19, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break through and steal. And uh, that that's literally true. Um, maintaining stuff in the ancient world was very difficult. Like, for example, if you had anything made of wool, then moths were a, a constant problem. In fact, I, there's at least, I think, four verses in the Bible that talk about moths eating things up because moths were a problem. And you could have, you know, if you had one piece of wool clothing, then you could kind of keep the moths off it. But if you tried to have a closet full, well, you were going to have a problem unless you had a slave that was deputized to guard your closet. So moth, moths would eat up things. By the way, moths would eat woolen garments, but, you know, um, goats are browsers. And if you leave your linen garment out, <laughs> then you're go to eat it. So you've got to be really careful in the biblical culture to keep your clothing. So, you know, in today's world, we have all these, uh, what they call synthetic fibers and all this stuff. I mean, I've had clothes in my closet that, you know, sit there. I never pay any attention. I don't look for moths. I don't worry about the goat eating anything. You know, you've got all this clothing and you just don't worry about it. That was simply not the case in the biblical world. You know, if you didn't pay attention to your clothing, it somehow or other, it got eaten or fell apart or, or whatever. And the same thing with rust. In the biblical culture, they didn't have any rust-oleum paints. They didn't have any good rust inhibitors. 
in the Gentile world, the Greeks and Romans typically used pig fat, of course, the, and would coat their iron stuff. Um, the Jews, of course, wouldn't do that. So they tried to use like olive oil and that kind of thing. But the bottom line was that if you had stuff made of, made of metal, then you had problems with it. So why, why gather up a whole bunch of clothing and a whole bunch of metal things? And sure, yeah, it looks like wealth, but it, it, it just takes your time and causes problems. And then thieves, you know, where thieves break through and steal. And that was, you know, a, a perennial problem. One of the reasons that, you know, when I wrote the Christmas story about the animals coming into the house at night was so they wouldn't get stolen. And, you know, and thieves were basically everywhere in the ancient world because stealing stuff was so easy. And, you know, my stuff looked like your stuff. Like if somebody ran off with your clay pot, try to prove that it's yours. <laughs> I'd say, well, I, I use the same potter as you do. You know, this is my pot, <laughs> you know, unless you're scratching your name or something on the side of your pots or something. It, but, and there wasn't any police force. So even if you knew that somebody stole your stuff, if you didn't have more muscle in your house than they did in theirs, you couldn't get it back. And, and so, you know, when he says, you know, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because they go away and they're problematic and they take your time. But look at the option. Verse 20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. There's no moths up there. There's no rust. There's no thieves. You know, when you do good deeds, when you spend time in prayer, when you're witnessing, when you're doing great stuff for other people, you're helping out. Maybe you serve and volunteer someplace. You know, when you're doing all that, then God's up there in heaven with his angels and his little book. You know, he's writing down this stuff. You'll get repaid for all that. And, and there's no thief, no moth, nothing's going to take it away. So what Christ here says here is so practical. You know, just kind of don't put your time and energy into collecting stuff. Put your time and energy into building a big storehouse full of stuff up in heaven. And then Christ makes this incredibly powerful statement. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, it typically starts out the opposite. You know, for example, let's say you have a heart for football. And so you collect the football helmet and you collect the football and you collect maybe a piece of a goalpost from a team that won. Uh, except, you know, because you really like football, then you end up with a second helmet and then you end up with a jersey and then a couple jerseys and then somebody's shoes. And the next thing you know, you have all this football stuff and then your heart shifts. Instead of you getting football stuff because you like it, now here's your football stuff. And so that's where your heart goes. And now that's where your time and your energy goes. That's where your conversations go. And so there's a, there's a shift and we have to be careful that if we build up our treasure on earth, that our heart will eventually move in that direction. But if we build up our treasure in heaven, then our heart is always moving toward godliness. And then verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is generous, the, the Greek word is single. It's an idiom. It means generous. There's commentary on that. If your eye is generous, your whole body will be full of light. And that's exactly right. When you meet generous people, their, their whole body is, they're, they're alive, they're light, because they're not burned down by all the cares of the world. They're, you're generous, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is stingy, you're hanging on to all your stuff, your whole body will be full of darkness. Why? Because you you, you got to be suspicious. The more stuff you have, the more suspicious you have to be that people are going to want it, take it, it's going to go away, something like that. Who the heck knows? You know. Um, and if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And he goes on, verse 25, and tells us not to be anxious about life. And that's a real challenge in our world, is to not be anxious. Um, when I start to get anxious over things, and, uh, you know, like anybody else, you know, it's pretty easy to get anxious over time, money, health, all kinds of things. Um, I, the, only, the only remedy that I've found that really works for me is to, to instead of trying to you know, I'm not going to think about what I'm anxious about. Instead, I, I shift and I am going to think about this. 
it's just like treating your mind like a little kid when if you take away what they're playing with, then they're all mad. But if you give them something else, then they get distracted. So you've got to give your mind something else to think about so that it doesn't get distracted. Let's go to chapter seven. This is our our last uh, chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, judging and hypocrisy. So here we are back to godliness and relationship. Our godliness is that we don't judge. And the relationship is then that we're going to have better relationships. If you go around judging people, you're not going to have good relationships. So don't judge. So you're not judged. And of course, in this case, that also means judged by God. And then it talks about, you know, are we critical of others? Verse three, do you see the splendor that's in your brother's eye, but not the beam that's in your own? And a lot of times, this is where you and I are the best helpers to other Christians. We've got to pray. We've got to walk with great kindness and great wisdom and watch our timing. But, you know, the problem with having your beam, a beam in your eye is you don't see it. Everybody else sees it, but you don't. And so the, if you see your brother or sister with a beam in their eye, if they really knew what it was, they wouldn't want it. They just don't know what it is yet. And so it, it takes it takes patience, love, kindness, prayer to approach people so that they are willing to examine the possibility that they have a beam in their eye. And if you if they can break through that, then you're you're really helping them out and really blessing them. Verse six, I think, is very important when it comes to walking in wisdom. And I think it's cool that Christ put this in the Sermon on the Mount, because obviously it, there's a, a whole range of people there from his more committed disciples to unbelievers, Pharisees, that kind of thing. So he says, do not give that which is holy to dogs, meaning to, in that culture, unholy uh, people, people that defy God, turn against God. Don't give that which is holy to dogs nor throw your pearls in front of pigs, again, an unclean animal, an unclean thing, lest they trample them under their feet, meaning that, you know, they're not going to respect the pearls that you give them. And then, but it's the last phrase in verse six that I think is so important because it says, and turn and tear you to pieces. A lot of times we are so zealous to help people, we're so zealous to witness, or we're so zealous to 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 share our opinion with somebody that you know that feels the opposite direction, that we um, we throw our pearl in front of them, and and what happens? They turn around and accuse us of all kinds of things. You know, like like I'm trying to think of a good example, but uh, just the fact that right now. For as much information is available about Jesus Christ, we're not completely safe, but we're pretty safe in saying that if a person doesn't confess Christ and believe in Christ in the day's world, that they are not going to enter into heaven because there's so much available about Christ that if somebody even has a little bit of curiosity, as God says, you know, if you ask, you will, you will get an answer, you will receive they have even a little bit of curiosity, then they will get led into the direction of more knowledge and eventually coming to Christ. But a, so a lot of times, what to us is a great pearl of wisdom that, hey, if you want to live forever, you need to do Romans 10, 9 and 10. You have to confess Christ and believe in your heart. And then you get to live forever. And we can think this is the world's greatest pearl of, of wisdom. And because they are, are pigs and they defy God and we're doing this at the wrong time or whatever, then the next thing is, you are so freaking narrow minded. I can't believe you'd think that God would only love people like you who confess Christ, people like me who don't like Christ, that I'm not good enough to get into your heaven, you know, and they turn around, they tear you to pieces. And so that, you know, this is one of the reasons that we're cautious in, in how we present the truth to people, who we present it to, the way we present it, uh, that we use great wisdom, we use great love, we pray for the, the best way to approach. Then starting in verse seven, and I like this, 
I love the uh, REV translation. Many of the modern versions are doing the same thing. It's the present tense active voice. Keep asking. It's not just ask and it will be given to you. And, and people get misled by that. And they think, in fact, I've actually heard it taught, um, ask and it will be given to you. And if you ask more than once, then you don't have faith. I don't know if you've heard that teaching or not, but I've certainly heard that teaching. The teaching is the, the, the scripture is keep asking. And they're thankfully, like I say, there are more and more modern translations going that way. We want something from God. We keep asking and it will be given. We keep seeking. We keep knocking. And, and it's that faithfulness that many times God responds to. And so that's a, a great teaching there. And then going to the, the narrow and wide gates and talking about who gets in and how how serious is this, how serious is obedience and, and that administration before the new birth. Uh, it was more serious today with the new birth. It's We have a permanent salvation, a guarantee of salvation, but we what's at stake for us is rewards. And then starting in verse 15, Again, how we can enter into relationship with people, how we can know where we stand. Beware of false prophets. You will recognize them, verse 16, by their fruit. That's super important. Um, one of the things we even see in the four Gospels is demonic and evil people are superb liars. They can look you in the face and absolutely lie. And we, we have to ignore the lies and move forward with, um, I mean, ignore what they say and move forward looking at their works. What is the fruit of their life? And that allows us then in most cases to sort out the people who are liars, deceivers, false, like the false prophets. And verse uh, 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And it was basically all a sham. They did it for themselves because verse 23, Christ says, I'll de declare to them, I never knew you. Away from me, you who work lawlessness. And then he closes the Sermon on the Mount by saying, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man. And that's really true. We've got chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven. The person who pays attention to this and makes it a part of their life is like a wise person who built their house on a rock. And the rain came, the floods came, came and you know the story. The, the house stood, the foolish person, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And then the rains come, the floods come. And what is that? That's the day of judgment. And they, the, basically the house fell. And, it's, and, it, and then he says, and great was its fall. And interestingly, he adds that. The rains come, the floods come, the winds blew, and it fell. But then he says, and great was its fall. What, what is it about this particular parable or this particular illustration that makes that fall great? And the thing that makes it great is the person doesn't have a chance to build another house. You've got one life. And if in that life you obey God and you build, then you get, you know, the, the, you get blessed by God, you get rewards, and your, your house stands. But if you take your life and you disobey and ignore the words of Christ, then when your house falls, the, that, that fall is great. Because then you because you have no time to say, oh, whoops, I didn't know about that. Let me start rebuilding again. Sorry, life is over. That's the end of it. And that's how serious we need to take things. In verse 28, he finishes the Sermon on the Mount. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as their experts in the law. Because the experts in the law would rarely put their, this is what I believe, this is what the text says. The experts in the law were usually like, well, Rabbi so-and-so said, but Rabbi so-and-so said, and so here are these various things and whatever. 
And Christ didn't do that. Christ was boom, boom, boom. And he taught like one who had authority because, of course, two things. He knew the scripture and he did have authority. So the Sermon on the Mount is a, a really wonderful piece to read through, meditate on the different sections, and, and see how the, 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 the shift in the interplay between the hope, personal godliness, and the importance of relationship. And it's all interwoven here into one beautiful teaching. So thanks for being with me tonight through this. This is it's really been super fun for me to read over this and think about this and 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 pray about what I wanted because you know, like I say, you, you couldn't teach all the verses, but it's just an absolutely awesome uh, thing to read and to meditate on.